Most of my career has been in risk management and regulatory relations, and most recently I was with GE Capital. I began with GE Capital as they were preparing to be regulated by the Federal Reserve and becoming a CIFI, so my role there was really working with the risk team to advise the risk team on regulatory expectations. After a couple of years, I had the opportunity to move to London. And in London, I had a great experience with dealing with the locally with the UK regulators, the Prudential Regulation Authority, and then overseeing the relationship with all the regulators outside the US. And I was in London when GE announced that it was changing its strategy and was going to be divesting itself of most of its uh, capital businesses, which gave me the opportunity to help GE Capital in London set up a new intermediate holding company and get approval from the regulators to move all of the legal entities underneath that, um, that entity. So it was a really fantastic experience and I learned an, an amazing amount doing that. Prior to GE, I spent 18 years at Société Générale, the French bank, and I began there as an internal consultant and primarily working on risk-related and credit-related issues. I managed a credit operations area and um, was the chief operating officer for the risk division in the Americas before moving laterally to become a deal approver, uh, credit assessment officer. And then after I did that, I was given the opportunity to go to Hong Kong to set up the risk division in uh, for the Asia Pacific region, consolidating people in five different countries and bringing them to Hong Kong, uh, creating a cohesive team that had delegated authority to actually um, approve deals in Hong Kong. So most of my career is in risk management and that risk management foundation put me in a very good position to help organizations interface with regulators, understand what their priorities were, and really prepare themselves to interact productively with their regulators. I really think there are three key attributes or abilities for a regulatory affairs executive. Regulatory affairs executives really need to have the confidence, respect, and trust of both management and the regulators. So they have to have a very good solid grounding in the bank and the organization's operations, but also have a very good handle on regulatory requirements and regulations. So this is sometimes you know, ideally there'll be a foundational and broad understanding of the businesses and the organization, and then also direct in-depth exposure to the regulatory environment. So that can come either from working at a regulator or through uh, significant interaction with regulators in a financial services organization, or possibly even through uh, working in a consulting uh, firm that, that does consulting on regulatory relations. There's really no one career path, but a successful regulatory executive often has a background in risk, compliance, legal, or again, in some sort of role within a regulatory agency where they're dealing with their supervisory, with dealing with supervisory oversight. You're often dealing with issues that are often very high stakes and high stress situations, where you have to really accurately assess the regulatory priorities understand how they relate to your organization and its strategy, effectively communicate this to senior management and the board, and then work with management to proactively anticipate or address the regulatory issues and concerns that, that come up in the organization. You really need to have strong management and leadership skills. The, the scope of regulatory approach and touch in the organization. It's really everywhere in the organization. So there's nobody that's going to have the full level of expertise or, or deep expertise in all of the various different areas where the regulators will be interacting. So you really need to be able to build a team of experts and be able to lead them. And these people really need to be well-respected, empowered, and proactive, and need to be able to gain the trust of the people in the organization so that they can really help them figure out how best to address any of the regulatory questions or issues. 
The dynamic between the financial institutions and their regulators has changed dramatically since the financial crisis when regulators really literally felt like they were staring into the abyss and really had to take action to save the financial system. Since then, you know, obviously we've had new laws, regulations, and supervisory approaches where in particular the supervisory approach has elevated risk and regulatory conversations to the board level where it really didn't have it before and with a significant sense of urgency and attention that really wasn't previously the norm. Regulators have pushed banks and other financial institutions to literally spend billions of dollars improving data, systems, processes, and governance, all of the foundational aspects of their internal governance and management. And this has really all been in an effort to better understand and anticipate their current and future risks, and then to ensure much better resiliency should those risks materialize. So therefore, you know, interaction with the regulators is both more intense, it's at a higher level, and it's more strategic as well. The pendulum may have swung a bit now that those better practices are firmly embedded in, in most organizations. That happens with regulations and people invested a lot and spent a lot of time and so it might be swinging back a little. But I really think that organizations have recognized the benefit of developing a positive and productive relationship with their regulators and also, unfortunately, the perils of failing to do so. Overall, institutions that gain the respect and confidence of their regulators will find themselves in a much better position to have a productive dialogue with the regulators as they pursue their strategy. Candidates for regulatory affairs positions really need to understand the organization's business and its associated regulatory challenges. So looking at an organization's history with their regulators is a great starting point. There are many resources for this, but you can often go online to look at the financial disclosures that the organization publishes itself. Plus, you can go on to regulatory websites and look at anything that's public information there. But aside from that, getting the facts on where that organization is, what's really more important is the culture of the organization and the importance that management and the board place on regulatory issues. Any candidate really needs to be able to answer a whole series of questions about that regulatory relationship. Does the organization have strong credibility with its regulators or does its credibility need to be enhanced? If it needs to be enhanced, who's championing that effort? Are regulatory issues resolved in a timely manner? If not, why not? What are the reporting lines for the regulatory affairs team? Who will you be working with most closely? In what forum are regulatory issues discussed and addressed? What does the organization see as its regulatory priorities? Having a better understanding of answers to those questions will really help you understand how the position fits within the organization and really what the organization's goal is in dealing with their regulators. Turning around a difficult relationship with the regulators, which many organizations have had, um, can be a really energizing career challenge, but no regulatory affairs person can really drive that on their own. You really have to have the buy-in of the most senior executives, so it's really important to understand what their view is and the sort of resources that those senior executives are willing to put towards um, addressing any regulatory issues that might exist. First of all, you really need to have the confidence of management and the regulators, which means that you have to be able to understand and articulate the perspectives of both. Normally, they have a common long-term goal of ensuring a sustainable organization, but their immediate concerns are likely to vary. Management is very concerned with the organization's strategy and the allocation of resources aligned with that strategy. So they're gonna be interested in meeting regulatory expectations in the most efficient and effective manner, but one that aligns with its strategy and where they wanna allocate their resources. The regulators, on the other hand, likely prioritize timeliness and thoroughness. So they may want to see results and completion of projects along a timeline that is not 100% consistent where management wants to allocate its resources. So appropriately assessing the urgency of the regulatory issues and providing clear and sound advice to management without being alarmist about regulatory challenges is really important and it's really can be really challenging to balance those two. 
The difference between leading regulatory affairs regionally versus globally, for me, I really think of them as being mirror images of each other. The global lead is normally the person that interfaces with the home regulator and the regulator that's responsible for supervising the whole organization. So those people have to have a very good handle of what's going on in the whole organization and they are closest to what the home regulator wants, but those priorities really are applied to the whole organization. The global lead also sets the tone for regulatory relationships throughout the whole organization, and they have an obligation to really make sure that all of the people in the regional offices understand what the priorities are and what sort of activities are going on to meet the regulatory requirements of the home regulator. The regional and local leaders, on the other hand, they usually have primary responsibility and normally the expert in dealing with relationships with the host regulators, the ones in the countries where the regions or the subsidiaries are. They do need to have a good understanding of what's going on with the home regulator because they may very well be supporting projects or, or talking about um, how they match up, the local organizations match up against those requirements. But they also are, you know, the, the global leaders really rely on them for the expertise locally and they have to be able to communicate to the central organization and the global lead what's going on in their region. So really the common thing is that both roles really rely very heavily on strong communication skills and an ability to work at distance often in a matrixed organization structure to make sure that each of the parties is very well informed about what is going on either centrally and globally for the regulatory relationship or um, locally for the dealing with the local regulators. Optimal organizational positioning for regulatory affairs really depends on the institution. But I, the common theme that's really, you've seen over the last several years is really an elevation of the role stature and the mission within the organizations. Historically, regulatory affairs teams or functions might have been within legal or compliance and often risk teams had people that were dedicated to dealing with regulators. Um, but the primary activities of those teams, and I'm really speaking historically here, was often highly administrative in nature. They managed exams and they managed issues. Um, they responded to regulatory inquiries and sometimes they worked on compiling regulatory filings. These are all really critical activities and they need to be done well. Um, but organizations, I think, are realizing that their regulatory relationships are far more strategic. Organizations really need leaders who can understand and can anticipate the regulator's perspective and can productively contribute their insight to strategic discussions at the highest level of the organization, including with the C-suite and the board. So with this elevation in stature, today's regulatory teams often have representatives at the executive management level and sometimes reporting directly to the CEO. These regulatory affairs teams are normally interacting with and supporting the areas that get a lot of attention from regulators. So they support the whole institution, but often find themselves dealing with a few areas uh, in particular. Those areas, given the regulatory focus on control and governance, often are compliance and risk. So the relationship between the regulatory affairs teams and the compliance and the risk teams really needs to be quite good. Regulatory teams can be quite helpful in assessing new regulatory requirements and the issues that regulators raise, and then also working to implement solutions that will be effective and efficient from the organization's perspective. Some organizations find that an informal or formal matrix structure provides um, important added value to the regulatory relationship. So key businesses support functions and control functions will have a designated team member that is linked to the regulatory affairs team. So they may not have a direct reporting structure, but there are usually mechanisms to keep those people informed about what's going on on uh, the regulatory level, and also have those people have a contact for raising any sort of highlights or regulatory issues that they anticipate or see in their own business or function. Since the financial crisis, I think there have really been three key trends in risk management. Again, similarly to regulatory teams, there's been an elevation in stature. The team's resources have expanded significantly, and there's often a direct link to the board level. Another trend is the increased reliance on data and models that the regulators have really forced through um, the CCAR process, 
but also you know liquidity management, um, lots of emphasis on having good data and then having very good governance around the models that are using that data to demonstrate um, a company's, uh, you know, an organization's resilience. In addition to that, there's been a significant emphasis on rigorous governance supported by effective controls and meaningful management information systems. So really the game for risk management has really been upped quite a lot. And as with the pressure on risk management, you know, they're really key in the organization. The regulators look very much to risk um, as the people who are putting the processes and governance in place to really make sure that the company is resilient. What the regulators are really looking for in risk management is that risk people, their conversations are grounded in effective challenge, that they really are working with the business people, sort of giving, in a way, I think of it as being the devil's advocate. I mean, you really wanna make sure that all issues are raised, everything comes out in the open, that you're challenging what the business is and what management wants to do. And really, if you think about it, that's just the best thing for the organization because management wants to have the best information possible so that they can make the most informed decisions. And that's a lot of what risk managers are doing today is really making sure that the proper mechanisms are in place, the behavior behaviors are in place to get that information in front of management and the businesses through the process of effective challenge so that they can make the best decisions possible.